If you live in Melbourne, listen up. We are hosting our first ever live podcast recording. We're going to do a live episode of the What You Will Learn podcast. You can be in the room as it happens. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash event to grab your ticket. That's if you live in Melbourne. If you don't live in Melbourne and would love to head to a live podcast recording, send us an email, podcast at whatyouwillearn.com. Let us know what city you're in. Who knows where we might pop up next. But if you're in Melbourne and if you want to come to our first ever live podcast event, plus you'll get a special bonus for attending. You'll see that when you head to the event page, uh, what you're in for. It's a little secret that you'll hear more about soon. Whatyouwillearn.com slash event, E-V-E-N-T. We hope to see you there. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of the laws of simplicity by John Mader, design, technology, business, and life. Simplicity is a bit of an opportunity. Uh, when did he write this? 2006. He said that you know, Citibank had a simplicity credit card. Ford had a simplicity pricing model. Uh, he says the trend towards simplicity is, is inevitable. It's still there. I think we're all just crying out for simplicity in different ways. But the world doesn't really go that way because imagine in a world where, say, software companies out there, they have the goal of trying to simplify their programs every year by shipping 10% fewer features at a 10% higher cost due to the expense of simplification. Yeah, sometimes it is, you know, paradoxically harder to make things simple and, you know, probably cost more and more engineers to uh, make things more simple and more elegant. But when you're saying, hang on, you're giving me 10% less stuff and I'm paying 10% more, it doesn't really add up, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't rationally, but mm. intuitively, you probably would buy, pay more for something that was simpler, hadn't had uh, less features, even though we're trying to mm. do the opposite. Yeah. Well, he said when he wrote this book, the iPod took off. The other digital music players and MP3 players out there uh, objectively did more stuff. They were more complex. There were, there were more features. There were more things you could do. But the iPod obviously took off and dominated them all, even though it did less, but it was more simple. So, uh, it's, and it cost a hell of a lot more. So, he's yeah. saying that, okay, so it doesn't really add up in our brain that, you know, it does less, but we pay more. But actually, in the real world, it did work out. Well, a more recent example is anytime I get a new Microsoft product, it tries to shove down the Microsoft Explorer down my throat. Mm. The first thing I do is, oh, just it's painful to look at. There's just too much stuff going on that front page. Mm. First thing is always download Google Chrome, get rid of all that <laughs> shit. I just want that, that one bar to open when I go because right. it's simplicity, mate. That's right, simplicity. Uh, simplicity is a quality that not only evokes passionate loyalty for product design, but also has become a key strategic tool for businesses to confront their own intrinsic complexities. He says the hunt is on for a simpler, more efficient way of moving the economy forward. Now, he opens with a big papa here and well, he has a bunch of laws. We're going to narrate some of the laws out, but he says reduce. So, the simplest way to achieve simplicity is through thoughtful reduction. Surprise, surprise. I think we're going to have a short episode here. We're going to try, we try to reduce all the, all the shit out of the book as we possibly could. It makes sense. I, I respected the fact that it was a book on simplicity and it was 98 pages or something. Yes. If he made a very complex, dense 600-page book about simplicity, he's doing something wrong. So, I feel in, in order to honor the essence of the book, it has to be a short and simple episode. He talks about DVD players which were all the rage when he wrote this in 2006, maybe a little bit outdated. Jeez, the but world's if- changed quickly, hasn't it? <laughs> Big time. But he's saying that, okay, you got a DVD player, you want to remove a lot of the unnecessary complexity. What do you need to do? All you need to do is put the disc in the slot and press play. That's to remove all the other stuff and make it as simple as possible. You would just have a play button. But what happens if you want to replay your favorite scene or pause the movie? Um, the fundamental question is, where is the balance between simplicity mm. and complexity? The simplest possible thing is play, but obviously you need some other things if you that's need right. to go to the bathroom, so you need pause, and it's add up from that way and finding that balance. So that's really the fundamental question and removing all the crap that you don't need out of it. That's right. How can you make it as complex as it has to be, but also as simple as you can possibly make it? On one hand, you want the product to be uh, easy to use, but on the other hand, you need it to do everything someone might want it to do. So it really is a bit of a balancing act. So the man, he's got a framework here and he says she's always right because she... That's a good she, law in, in, uh, in life, I'd say. It is. And also law. in simplicity. And in simplicity. So it's, uh, what is it, acronym? Acronym. 
Yeah. Jeez, I can't believe I forgot and the word. No, I think it's an initialism. But. An initialism. So <laughs> S-H-E, and we're beginning with shrink. That's right. She's always right, probably in your personal life, and then she's always right in simplicity of design because, yeah, we're talking about shrink, hide, and embody. And to shrink obviously means to make something smaller. Uh, whenever you see a you know a small object that exceeds our expectations, we're often surprised and pleased. Uh, you know, Our usual reaction is, how did something so small do all of that? I don't know if, mate, is that something you've experienced in your personal life? <laughs> I think Johnny might have by the sounds of it. <laughs> oh, God. He's, so, he wrote this book to just have, um, make way for his simple little, little, uh, Sim- little simple seller. shrinker. The simple, <laughs> he shrinked it. Jesus. Oh, God. Just there is, I'll give you, I'll, from my personal life, I've experienced this more from the, uh, an Apple TV remote. Oh, yeah. I remember on the TV remote that we had was a big, clunky like a big rectangle it was big in the hand and then you pick up the little apple tv remote Mm. which looks like there are no buttons on it it's just got a little square that does you can do stuff with it and at first you might be thinking how on earth does this thing work but then amazingly it can do all the things that that big remote with 300 buttons can do but much more simply well right there so there is something weird in the human brain that that likes this delicate and fragile thing and he says that the science of trying to make things appear like this is a is really uh, scattered throughout history in art because for some reason artists try and, uh, trying to evoke this emotion that are in our fellow human beings in the work they create. So whoever the lad or female was who, who came up with that was, was going hard at that part of the psychology. That's right. He even says that the early um, designs for the iPhone, I thought the iPhone was 2007 and he wrote this in 2006. Yeah. yeah. Maybe he was maybe he was ahead of the curve. Maybe, maybe he, he knew the, what was coming. The, the he knew the trends old Johnny. <laughs> That's right. So he says that the initial iPhone was uh the back was like it was a mirrored surface. So what it meant was when you put it down on something, it kind of felt like it sort of adapted to its surroundings and all you could see was this thin floating white plastic layer which was the screen and everything else kind of uh disappeared around it. So by making something look like it had been shrunk makes it feel more powerful. Yeah, I like it. So that's the first one. S for shrink. Uh, H is hide. And uh, this is a really good one. When all features can be removed, have been, so you've trimmed everything out and it's small, it's it's slim, it's light, it's fragile. The next method is to hide it. And uh, I'll tell you what clothes I like, mate. Just rest. I just like plain clothes. Mm. And I think it's just, yeah. for some reason, it's just less in the head because they just hide everything away. That's right. I can't go shrink because my, my body's too big. <laughs> my gut's a bit too big for, for small clothes, but but I'll take on this hide. <laughs> there you go. Um, that, is a, that is a good method for hiding things. Another method is like the, you've got your remote. I think um, uh, probably like the aircon remote normally. You've got your main buttons. You've got your on, off, warmer, colder, those three buttons. Uh, and then you can slide that little flap down. There's all these different things below it. There's like the timer that you can set it to go on or off. You can change the angle of the fan. You can uh, you can change the intensity of the fan. You can change the direction from side to side. There's all those things that can do, but they're kind of hidden below that flap. So he's saying that you've got your simple function. You know, most of the time you just need on and then, you know, turn it up or turn it down. But if you want those extra things, you can't really remove the complexity of that functionality, but it is hidden behind the thing where only if you need it, you can go to it. I like it. And of course, another one there is the Swiss Army knife. So mm. on its on the surface, it just looks like a tool. It's pretty elegant, but the design is so good because within that little 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 Jimmy Bob, there's all <laughs> sorts of uh, weapons and um, things you could use in a, in a gunfight. And then the E in she is embody. So he says, you know, the features, they've gone into hiding, the products themselves have shrunk. It becomes even more uh, necessary now to embed or to embody the object with this sense of value. So we've shrunk it down, we've hidden all the stuff, but we need to embody that even though it is small and a lot of the features are hidden, it's still a very important, powerful thing that you need to have in your life. So the embodying quality is really a critical factor. So let's say if you, you might have a website or something like that, or and you're trying to get to a help page, you could write the word help uh, there in a big word, click here to get your help. Or if you're trying to um, use these principles, you might actually turn it all into a, one little question mark on the corner of the screen because mm-hmm. you're embodying that call for where you might help to that question mark. And for some reason, our intuition just knows what hitting that question mark um, might do. So really you're trying to embody things in smaller symbols as much as you can, which have a lot more complexity underneath. 
I like it. And body can also come through uh, marketing messages, which you can use to kind of really pump up the essence of this product. Or another one is say, you know, when you've got a superstar athlete like Michael Jordan wearing Nikes, they don't have to go out and spruik how good Nikes are. They just need that image to embody that, okay, if, if, if a superstar is wearing sneakers like these, there must be some kind of heroic qualities embodied inside of this. So, if in the terms of really good design, you need to get that feeling that the thing is precious and it might come from literally precious materials or exquisite craftsmanship. Um, think about the Ferrari, the car. They've got a lot of shit going on underneath the surface, but on the very top, it looks like a, quite a simple design. But all the parts go into it. They're the best of the best. They're the best in the business. And that's really those expensive and uh, quite crazy parts come together to produce a legendary car. Yeah, so that that's our she. She's always right. Uh, to shrink, hide, and embody. We want to lessen what we can. We want to conceal everything else, but we also don't want it to lose its inherent sense of value. Another principle for the toolkit here is organize. And one way of thinking about this is the home. It's usually a huge battleground when it comes to facing the daily challenge of managing all the complexity. Now, I must say that he wrote this book before (laughs) Kondo because Kondo just basically took this law and then just ramped it up and sold a lot more books than old Johnny there. So, Johnny should have just gone more niche than he did. I reckon. But say, uh, you know, if we're going back before the times of the KonMari method, he uh, says that, okay, so you got in your house, you got a whole bunch of crap everywhere. You know, it's a bit of a constant battle. Now, there's really three potential strategies here for trying to simplify your home. One is to buy a bigger house. And obviously, that means if you've got more room and the same amount of shit, then uh, in a relative sense, it seems like it's more cleaned up. A second strategy is to put everything that you don't really need right now, put that into storage to clear it out. Or the third is to organize all your stuff into a nice system. So, the typical solutions have mixed results. Obviously, just go out and spend the big bucks to get a bigger home. You're going to lower your clutter to space ratio. But if you can seal the magnitude of the clutter, it's more of an unnuanced approach that is guaranteed to work by the first law of reduce. There are really only two questions to ask in it, and these were the ones ripped by Meredith Condo, I think. What to hide and where to put it. That's right. Without much thought or, uh, you know, if you've got enough hands on deck, a messy room can quickly become free of clutter in no time, and it's probably going to stay that way for a little bit, a day or a week, if you just move the stuff. You know, if you buy a bigger house and move it or if you put everything into storage, but uh, the longer term, you kind of need that the, the solution of what goes with what. He says, like, for instance, in a closet, for Johnny Boy, he's got six different sort of sections of his closet. He's got ties, shirts, slacks, jackets, socks, and shoes. He must be freeballing. He's got no jocks in this. And no, maybe he's got a different... But anyway, he's saying that, he, you know, he can well, have... Well, I wouldn't be surprised if someone's <laughs> reducing. What's the need for jocks? He's probably asking everything. Do I need That's these right. jocks? It's too complex. Right. Let it free. <laughs> That's right. But he says that, okay, he could have potentially a thousand different items in his wardrobe, but they could be organized neatly into just those six categories. So, organization makes a system of many things appear much fewer Um, because if you only hold just a number of groups, it's much less than the number of items to be organized. So, that was clothes being one thing. Or if you think about YouTube, you've got playlists, which you click on a playlist that goes into things or a website. You've probably got a a category of things like your your main level and then your sub-level, you click on that, that it opens up different categories of different things. So, Johnny, he likes simplicity. Instead of shrink, hide, and embody, he had she... And so now he's he's simplified another one here. Instead of sort, label, integrate, and prioritize, we've got slip. Slip it on. The slip method. The slippy boy. So slip, S, sort. So firstly, write down on small post notes on each datum, which needs to be slipped. Move them around on the flat surface. Um, For example, you might have as well, Maria Kondo, she says, put everything in your house into the one thing in the room. Then you've basically got everything out that needs to be sorted. That's right. After you sort, then it's time to label. So that's when you you know you're moving all the t-shirts into one pile. This is your t-shirt pile. Then you're moving all your skirts into another pile. That's your skirt um, category. So once you've kind of sorted each thing that goes with each uh, other related thing, then you give each category a name. After that, you integrate, put everything into groups like each other. Um, in some groups, you might need to break apart here. Yeah, that's kind of like saying, okay, I've got this, uh, I've got this group, I've got this t-shirt group, I've got this uh, singlet tank top group, I've got this polo shirt group, I've got this, uh, you know, button-up shirt group. Maybe just make a group, mush them all together, and just call this the top 
tops group. Tops group. And sometimes that might work. Um, sometimes you might need to break things apart. You might have your suits. You might have a you know a funeral suit and a wedding suit and a I don't know. There was a the, probably falling apart a bit there, but yeah. basically once you, you've kind of got your groups, so you want to kind of mix and match those groups to uh, make them as few groups as possible. And finally, you need to prioritize. So, collect all the highest priority items into a single set to ensure they got the most attention. So, we're putting things, we've got limited amount of wardrobe space. We want to be put, popping the suits in there. We don't want to be putting each pair of undies or whatever, each sock this Johnny <laughs> Johnny's wearing, give it a coat hanger and give it some wardrobe space. That's pretty stupid. <laughs> That's right. He says, yeah, groups are good. Sometimes too many groups are bad because they kind of counteract the goal of grouping in the first place. As you say, if you've got a group of blue socks and a group of red socks and a group of green socks, and what's the point of grouping them anyway? Um, but he's saying that the best way to do this is to kind of, you know, I suppose the, the downside of having too many groups is like, what's the point? But then the downside of having too few groups is that the more you try to cram stuff together, you kind of lose a bit of the, they become less concrete, they become a bit more abstract. If you mush every single top together, all of a sudden you don't have like your, you know, casual around home tops versus you're going out to a pub tops versus you're going to a wedding tops. So if you just cram them all together, you kind of lose a bit of the sense of the, uh, the distinctions between the different groups. So again, it's a bit of a balancing act between simplicity and complexity here. Which comes into another one of his laws, and this is what lies on the periphery of simplicity is definitely not peripheral. Mm. That hurt my brain that's a bit. A, that's a bit deep, isn't it? What's going on? <laughs> what, what is that? Sometimes he says, yeah, the things that seem like they're just on the edges, maybe there wasn't just the things that were forgotten about. You know, if you've got that extra thing just tucked off in the corner there, it doesn't necessarily mean it was just the last thing that was thought about in the corner. Maybe it was intentionally tucked away in the corner. Yeah, and it's a bit of a counterintuitive. Like another way of saying it is like nothing is something. Like mm. I was saying before, uh, if I, I love my blank shirt because mm. it's blank, but that's something. Mm. That is it's something. like um, if you've seen The Devil's Wears Prada. No. Oh, geez, I'm going to do a poor job of describing <laughs> it, but the, the beautiful young lady on her first day going into a design studio and she's basically saying, look, I don't really care about design. She's just wearing this um, blank shirt and blank everything and then Meryl Streep, she just rips into her and tears her a new asshole, basically saying, <laughs> um, you know, people in the room in an office in a boardroom actually were talking specifically about you, someone who's chosen this level of design. So, mm -hmm. you know, subconsciously, she is all about design, but... You know, choosing the, the person who yeah. doesn't look like a designer. <laughs> anyway, that was a poor way of saying it, but it's a really good movie. You should watch it. <laughs> Devil wears Prada. That's right. A lot of a lot of times uh, are presented with sort of blank space, like a blank canvas or you know extra room on the page that we kind of feel like needs to be filled. Whereas a designer is going to think, actually, I want to preserve that blank space as much as possible. We sometimes think that something is something, as in we've got to put something there. Otherwise, it's going to be wasted space. Whereas a designer, the simplicity man is thinking actually nothing is something. By, by preserving that blank space, uh, it seems like, oh, you know, it's one of his laws of, you know, what is periphery is not peripheral. You know, even though you might just think, oh, there's this little blank space in the corner here. Why did they leave that? But actually, that was intentionally left there. Yeah. Well, I think it's what uh, Stubby did a very good job for our book design, mm. might we say, because... All he did was basically text on the front page with nothing else. And we originally, we went to, uh, wasn't Fiverr, it was what, 99 Designs, who mm. were a good sponsor at some stage for the show. But every designer who tried to come in just tried to throw stuff on. Mm. But for Stubby, it was basically just the text on page and there was a lot of blank space around the text. And, yeah. and it was a beautiful design, but it's hard to intuitively understand why. Eh? Yeah, blank space is an important one because it's kind of like the more... Uh, white space or blank space that remains in a design. Uh, it means that there's kind of less information presented, which seems like a bad thing. But really what it means is that proportionally more attention is paid to what is left. So because there's less stuff available, it means the uh, intensity of the focus is increased. So we were going to, dra we were going to drag the episode out with a couple of little things. We thought we'd just... <laughs> Um, embody the simplest method and slip a few different things <laughs> away from the, rem the removalist and uh, that's why we end up the conclusion here. The thing is though, we've been talking all about simplicity and saying complexity is bad but it's like uh, you can't have simplicity without complexity. It's like saying nobody only wants to eat dessert. Even a little kid, if you say you can have ice cream all day every day for three meals a day, eventually you're probably going to get sick of ice cream. 
So he's saying that simplicity, just by stripping everything back, eventually you're going to get sick of simplicity and you're going to crave complexity. But thankfully, because our world is constantly getting more and more complex, the simple can stand out. Yeah, we'll think about technology specifically. It's only going in the direction of complexity mm. and it's a bit of a yin-yang here. So when you design, you're probably, your safest bet is probably going in the direction of um, simplicity. If you do so, it's going to make and set your product apart. As we said at the start, in that uh, context, there's a lot of people just trying to throw more and more features in into things and people could probably get the, the, the featureitis disease and just go on that path. But for you, your simplicity always works. Simplicity, it's hopelessly subtle. Many of its defining characteristics are simplicity. It's all about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. If you live in Melbourne, listen up. We are hosting our first ever live podcast recording. We're going to do a live episode of the What You Will Learn podcast. You can be in the room as it happens. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash event to grab your ticket. That's if you live in Melbourne. If you don't live in Melbourne and would love to head to a live podcast recording, send us an email, podcast at whatyouwillearn.com. Let us know what city you're in. Who knows where we might pop up next. But if you're in Melbourne and if you want to come to our first ever live podcast event, plus you'll get a special bonus for attending. You'll see that when you head to the event page, uh, what you're in for. It's a little secret that you'll hear more about soon. Whatyouwillearn.com slash event, E-V-E-N-T. We hope to see you there.